from Anshe Svar Beth El Emeth Congregation. It's time to take 10 minutes for Torah with Rabbi Joel Finkelstein. Welcome to our discussion of Purim. Why does the Megillah begin with a tremendous discussion of the elaborate wealth of Ahasuerus, the magnificence of his palace, the breadth of his kingdom, 127 kingdoms? What is the point of learning all this about Ahasuerus? Frankly, who cares? In fact, there is an opinion in the Mishnah that we don't need to begin the Megillah with the discussion of Ahasuerus. Rather, we begin either with Haman or the story of Mordechai. The question is further strengthened as to why the Talmud goes out of its way to discuss in detail this early section of the Megillah that deals with the grandeur of Ahasuerus' kingdom and majesty. There in the Gemara in Megillah 11a, Yud Aleph Amud Aleph, the Tanur Rabbanan, the rabbis taught, Shlosha Malchu Bekipah. There are three kings who ruled over, as Rashi says, the entire globe, the entire span of the heavens, the entire earth. Eluhain, these are the three, Achav, the wicked King Ahab, Achashverosh, the figure in the Megillat Esther, and Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king who destroyed the temple. Why does the, the Gemara go out of its way to claim that Ahasuerus actually ruled over the entire world at that time, from sea to shining sea, so to speak? Also, the Gemara elsewhere seems to go out of its way to describe the great political prowess of Ahasuerus. Uh, the Yen Malchut Rav Kiyat HaMelech, the Megillah says that there was a lot of wine that was provided for those in the kingdom as the king, uh, according to the king's generous hand. Amarav, one of the rabbis in the Talmud says, He gave each person wine that was older than he was. If he was 80, he'd give him wine that was 81 years old. If he was 20, he'd give him wine that was 21 years old. And he says also that he gave him, He gave each one the wine of his, of his kingdom, the wine of that particular culture. Everyone should appreciate the wine. Why is it the Torah goes out of its way to tell us the special political machinations of Ahasuerus? He gave different types of chairs to different people. Uh, he, he put different people in different sections of the palace, says the Gemara. He made different parties for different people, first the, the people in one area and then in another. Why do we need to know this? The answer, I believe, is that what the Megillah is telling us in underscoring is the precariousness of the Jewish people and their position at that time in the world. If indeed Ahasuerus is ruling over the entire globe as we know it, the entire sky, then indeed the Jews are in big trouble. Because where do you go when that king decides to kill the Jews? Who's going to be left if, if the one who rules over the entire known world is indeed a wicked man who wishes to destroy all the Jews. And to underscore this precariousness, the Megillah says that when Ahasuerus was confronted with the question of to kill the Jews or not, he said, it turns to Haman and he says, Va'am la sotbo kato Whatever you want, whatever you want to do, just like that. One flippant decision, and this king who's so powerful, who's so clever in the way he uh, deals with the different political factions, this king controls it all, and in one second, he can turn the fate of the Jews to death. In fact, the whole name of Purim, the whole idea of how Haman decided when he would kill the Jews, underscores this notion of the precariousness of the fate of the Jew, that in exile, and perhaps in life itself, the Jewish person stands so precarious that if someone simply turns the lot and the lottery happens to fall on a given day, that will be the day when the Jews will be killed. In fact, even our salvation took place in such a precarious way. It just happens to be that on that one night, right before, right before Ahasuerus was about to decide to kill Mordechai, and then 
do away with the Jews. Just as Haman was about to walk in there and say to his king who loved him so much, to say to him, we've got to hang this Mordechai figure. Just at that moment, Haman, sorry, Achashverosh, has this dream which brings about the salvation of Mordechai and ultimately the salvation of the Jews. He has this vision that he needs to remember something. And when he looks in the books, he determines that Mordechai had saved his life. And with this, all the Megillah and the whole plot turns in favor of Mordechai and the Jews. But if not for that one moment, the Haman, the wicked enemy, was about to enter the palace and ask for and probably be granted the death of Mordechai, and with that, the death of the Jews. And therefore, since this holiday celebrates and commemorates the, the precariousness of the Jews, we now understand why the Gemara opens up the discussion of Megillah with different psukim, different verses, one a verse from Tehillim, a verse from Psalms, that the verse that would describe and would be a proper and fitter, fitting opening for this entire book, it's a notion that we've been brought through the fire, trial by fire, trial by water. This is a Megillah, a place where, where we, our lives are in grave danger. And therefore the celebration of Purim is different from all other holidays. Now on the surface of it, it may seem like a similar celebration to other holidays. On Shabbat, Yom Tov, and Purim, we have festive meals. But the festive meal of Shabbat is somehow not a contradiction to a person being, let's say, in the third, fourth, or fifth day of his mourning. The, an Avel, a mourner, continues to mourn even as he has a beautifully set table on Shabbat. Because the meal on Shabbat requires not a festive heart, but a festive meal. On Yom Tov, that same festive meal is meant to change your heart, to be joyous. And therefore, no mourning can be had in your heart. Mourning is canceled on, during Yom Tov and a great holiday, like Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkos. And then, however, on Purim, that same festive meal, add a little wine to it, add a little drunkenness to it, and it takes on a whole different meaning. It's not so much joy in the sense of appreciating life. The joy of Purim is to appreciate the precariousness of life. And what's the best way, the rabbis say, to appreciate how precarious life is? It's nothing like, according to the official Talmud, to actually drink more than our measure. According to the earliest reading, to actually get drunk on Purim. Today, and many rabbis have said, it's not a good idea to get drunk on Purim, but to have one extra drink that you don't usually have. Why would the rabbis suggest something so crass, uh, so, so, uh, so challenging uh, to, our, to our, uh, our, our, uh, our constitution? And the answer is that it's on Purim, that as we take that drink, we kind of wonder, yeah, what is going on? And the world begins to swirl all around us. And we, we realize that, you know what? I don't, I don't know if I'm joyous or happy or if I'm sad. I'm not sure what I am. It's not real joy. Real joy, you don't get drunk. Real joy, you can take while you're awake. But we are in such a difficult, precarious situation in this galut exile mentality, exile situation, that actually the most appropriate thing to do is to have that extra glass of wine and then to say to yourself, where am I? Am I going to make it through? Is it just one press of a button from some crazy man from, from Iran and it's all over? What, 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 what is my situation here? Uh, how is my life going to go forward? And in whose hands does it all rest? These are some of the questions that Purim raises for us. And what's the solution? The solution is Chaverim Kol Israel, is the friendship of all of Israel. Shemishloach Manot Israel, each person sending gifts one to another, recognizing the connectedness of each Jew to another. With that connectedness, with Mordechai working with the Jewish people and everyone fasting in Esther together, we can solve this precariousness. Together, as a nation, our life is not precarious. We, indeed, will go on and live forever as a people. That's the message of Purim. On the one hand, there's great precariousness. On the other hand, the solution is to come together as Jews, and with that, to solve the very precariousness of life itself, and particularly life in exile. And hopefully with that, we will one, one day yet again 
experience a day when we can say, that one day we'll experience a day when there will be great joy, celebration and joy for all of the Jewish people throughout the world. So may it be for us in our day. Thank you for joining us here at the Anshay Sfar Beth Lameth Congregation for our webcast. I want to thank Jason Lefkowitz for making today's presentation possible. Feel free to, g- to email me at rabbijmf at gmail.com. Thank you. This has been 10 Minutes for Torah with Rabbi Joel Finkelstein.